We are Adam and Yvonne, and we are postdocs here at UCSD. Uh, we've been for a while. We're going to talk a little bit about us, our pathway, and how we got here. And hopefully you can identify or not identify, but then like we can help you out. Uh, we're going to try to make this a Q&A session in a sense. So we'll try to help out as much as possible or try to direct you with the people that could help you out in this process that we know that it can be stressful. So we're there. So a little bit, not, not so little, but <laughs> about me. So uh, I don't have the most normal pathway to academia. So maybe you can uh, tag along with me to my journey. So uh, I, I'm a I'm Mexican, I'm from Monterey, Mexico. So as you can see over there, it's the Northern part close to Texas and it's called the city of mountains. I know you can only see one there, but I can assure you there's mountains all around. Um, so I'm a biotech engineer from Tec de Monterrey. And then after I finished uh, my engineering uh, degree, I started working in education. So I started teaching in high schools and middle schools because I really like teaching. So I started doing that. I started uh, doing my master's in education, but I also liked a lot the research part. Actually, my, I have a minor in research and innovation. So I applied for several fellowships and I got, uh, I got some of them, but I'll talk to you about fellowships later. But I got one in, uh, in Europe, in Madrid, called uh, Fundación Carolina, which is like a regents kind of fellowship. And I went there to Madrid and I did my master's. And then that's where I started my love for plants. So I've been working with plants and viruses since the beginning of my career, which was over 10 years ago now. So I started my master's, I did my master's, and then I decided to stay there for my PhD as well. So I was working at the CBGP, which is the Center of uh, Plant Biotechnology and Genomics in Madrid. After I finished my PhD, which was in 2017, I came to Monterey. I came back to Monterey because one part of my fellowship was that I had to do at least two years in my home country so that I could like kind of bring back everything that I've learned and put it in, in, into academia in Mexico. So I started working at Tec de Monterrey. I started lecturing and also starting a, a, a postdoc there here at the Alvarez Lucillo lab in which I work with the viruses that I had previously worked on in my PhD but I incorporated them for biomed applications. So I started doing some bioprinting, hydrogels, et cetera. And I also started um, into the en entrepreneurship road. I started a company, uh, from, which is this one, Monterrey Tinta Verano. So I don't know if you've been to Spain or you know what Tinta Verano is, but it's basically a beverage, kind of a soda that has uh, wine, red wine. So we like produce that, we bottle that, and we sell it in different restaurants and, and different um, marketplaces in, in Mexico. So with all of that part, like I still was very involved in teaching. I was also very involved in research, kind of dabbling into the the entrepreneur side and then COVID striked. And I know that that might have been a change for everyone. So I started doing a lot of, we, we started doing research uh, COVID wise for COVID. And I also started doing a lot of more teaching. So I was teaching, um, I was lecturing in uh, university. I was teaching also in high school and I was teaching in middle school at that point. So I had all the levels um, and then I just found out that there was like a nature careers opening, well, like post for a postdoc here at UCSD at Nicole Steinmetz lab. So basically Nicole Steinmetz for me was like all my PhD, I like read about her and like, yeah, practically part of my thesis was like citing her. So I was like, yeah, I'll probably just 
like check it out and but I, I never thought that I was actually going to get it. But I did because apparently there are not a lot of plant virologists in the world. And I was one of those. So yeah, I came here at 2021, January 2021. So this is my third year at the nanoengineering uh, department. Just starting third year postdoc. But in total, this would be my fifth year as postdoc. So actually right now I've already, uh, I'm applying for uh, professor positions here at UCSD and around the area. Um, mostly in profess like teaching professor positions, as you may know that I'm now like very into teaching. So yeah, basically that's been my, my path. So I will try to give you a little like sense of the different areas that I've been into if you're more into like the industry part or the entrepreneur type uh, part or more into the ac academia part, or I don't know, we'll try to to figure it out as as we talk. And yeah, now Adam. No, I'm touching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Mine has a lot more white space, sorry. Uh, so I'm Adam, I'm from uh, Burbank, which I like to call the shadow behind the Hollywood sign. Um, and I, uh, just, this was just kind of fun, like overview of my life. So I also did, uh, when I was in high school, I did show choir, uh, which is like Glee. Uh, <laughs> and then I went to UCLA uh, for undergrad and I studied chemical engineering. And while I was there, I also worked as a parking attendant at the Hollywood Bowl, which was pretty cool. So I got to see concerts for free once the parking lot was full. Uh, and then I was like majorly a homebody and I kind of was like, you know what, I just need to like move at least once in my life. And so I only applied to grad schools that were kind of far away and I ended up at uh, Georgia Tech. And when I was there, when I was an undergrad, I was like one of those people that took every class and was like, I don't know what I want to do. Everything's cool. Uh, and I kind of ended up falling into like the more biomolecular side of chemical engineering and um, I worked in a lab like with two advisors, one who did kind of like protein engineering, fusion proteins, and one who did like biocatalysis. And so I like helped make an enzyme immobilization system and have like a lot of experience with like protein design. And then while I was there, I also uh, got a Chateaubriand fellowship and got to go uh, be a collaborator for five months in France, which was pretty cool. Uh, I don't speak French, so that was challenging, but. I made it work. And uh, I also learned during grad school, I had like a weirdly high number of opportunities to travel internationally. So I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I also got to go to like Singapore and all around Europe when I was uh, at the Genoscope uh, Fellowship. And yeah, I, uh, I think that's something really cool about academia is like how much travel we get to do, like if we're presenting at conferences and stuff. So that like really keeps me grounded in academia. I'm like, this is cool. <laughs> uh, and then I defended in May of 2020. And so it was like mid pandemic and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I basically stayed on as like a research assistant in the lab for like seven months and then I, unlike Yvonne, I didn't do anything with plant viruses for my whole PhD. I did not know who Nicole Steinmetz was, but my friend uh, was like, yo, she's kind of famous in drug delivery. You should apply. And she had like posted it on Twitter. And uh, so I actually found my postdoc on Twitter, which was cool. Uh, so then, yeah, I've been here at UCSD. We actually started like within three days of each other. So uh, we both started in January of 21. And uh, since I've been here, yeah, I've been in the nanoengineering department in the Steinmetz lab. I'm also pretty involved in the postdoc union. And then just fun stuff about me. This was my bestie and her dog in Atlanta. Uh, that's me in a lab coat. This is me at Pride here in San Diego. And uh, I'm pretty involved in like LGBT stuff with the uh, AICHE. So yeah, that's kind of my overview. And uh, I'm trying to apply in the fall to uh, professor jobs. So probably something with biotech and waste management is where I think I'm going because it kind of brings everything together, but still working that out. Yeah. So yeah, the first question that we wanted to know and to see where we should shift the conversation to is why are you here? 
So we're we're not gonna point fingers, or we're not gonna try not to, but like Maybe we could do like a raising hand. Yeah. So is anyone here considering doing like a post doc? I'm assuming many, if you're here. <laughs> Wait, we are here. Yes, yes. makes sense. Uh, I wasn't sure if you were here for the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> are you like one year before graduating, or like are you planning to graduate during this year? Anyone? Uh, I'm from Brazil. Uh, actually, I am at UCR right now. Oh. So I'm just visiting San Diego for one month. Oh, nice. And I'm um, uh, graduating in September this year. Mm -hmm. My PhD on electrochemical biosensors as a CEO. Well, so actually, because I, I also uh, hold a job position in Brazil, like a research assistant, you may say. So uh, right now, I'm trying to figure out my path where mm -hmm. I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to my job. I'm going to go find a postdoc. So that's why I'm here, actually. Yes. Else? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we just wanted a sense of like where everyone was in their career. So it seems like early to late grad school. So that's good. Okay. So also it's important that we kind of uh, not enumerate the tasks, but like get a sense of what a postdoc does and I think a lot of us think that a postdoc is just like a regular continuation of your PhD in a sense, like you're just going to continue doing research and have a little bit more of autonomy, but just like continue doing your project. And it could really be that, like if you want it to be that, uh, but we're also going to talk about other things, other skills that you could try to get out from your postdoc experience and that you should consider if you're applying for a postdoc. Like, well, I don't know if you have anything. No, I think that's oh, summarized okay. nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so does anyone like beyond like just doing like research heavy duty, what do you all think postdocs like typically do? Yeah. My group, but I feel like my advisor kind of insulates me from like other stuff that's not related to my project. <laughs> whereas like postdocs, seem to be like they have to do some heavy lifting and some dirty work. Uh, you know, they have to like check an appendix and read over whether a, a graduating student has made some errors. So they have to switch back and forth depending on the funding. But like for for grad students, I think my my group specifically, we just kind of we kind of protect it from other things that we don't really want to do. So as a, a in a show of hands, who of you have like a student or who mentors a student at graduate level, like in, at, in your PhD right now. Okay, so it's not the usual thing. As, as you were saying, like in PhD, usually you are like in your own thing. Maybe when you're like four or fifth year student, uh, sometimes they give you like an undergrad maybe to try to mentor. But yeah, like this is something that actually like changes when you become a postdoc. But I can also tell you, like, in our lab, we have postdocs that are also only doing research. Like, you could also still be a postdoc if that's what you want to do, like, only do research. But depending on what the next step should be in your, po like, after postdoc, you should try to see that transition uh, stage, the postdoc stage, as an opportunity to develop other skills that will set you up for your next job. Mm -hmm. One thing that we wanted like to say to you first is that um, postdocs, it would be your like first real job, like the first time you're not a student, even if some people say that you're a postdoc student, which for us is like <laughs> dramatic. Uh, <laughs> yes, and also like they tend to say that you're a postdoc trainee. Mm -hmm. I can get a hold of that because you're still like in a trainee position into being something like either in academia or in industry, et cetera. But even though it's still like your first real job, it's also a definite amount of time. So it's one year, two years, three years, you can go up like me and be five years, but I'll let you know why I did that. But yeah, like, it's a definite amount of time that is not going to be your permanent position. So in a way, it gives you uh, an opportunity 
of like also kind of venturing into stuff that you like and that you think you want to pursue in the future in the future but that doesn't like commit completely commit you into that field for example if i i had the idea that maybe i wanted to go more into biomed so my first postdoc i did more biomed stuff i eventually can like went back and right now i do agro stuff which was what i started with but still I got those skills, I got the opportunity to see that if I didn't like it as much, it's okay. It's not my, like my, it's not my permanent position. It's not like doing another degree in a sense. So you can kind of like balance that possibility of like another thing or another specialty. Yeah, all the advice I got was basically like, you wanna do something that you feel equipped to handle, but that teaches you new things, right? So like maybe it has, 20 to 50% overlap with what you were doing before, but is still teaching you a lot of new things because you're like, you're going to be paid like it's a training position. You're going to be treated like it's a training position. So you might as well get the training while you're there. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, I feel like we've already kind of mm -hmm. gotten into that. <laughs> so besides the mentoring part and the other skills that you can get, what other skills you can get, uh, you get into more like management stuff, not only in human resources, but actual like just resources, more into finance, finances, like uh, reagents, uh, getting to budgets, stuff like that. You also get into writing stuff, not only your manuscripts and your science, but actu actually writing grants or writing proposals or like more stuff that those skills you would need if you want to be in an academia uh, academia position mm -hmm. but i think are also very important if you're going into an industry position it also depends on like the size of the lab and the dynamic mm -hmm. right like we're in a pretty large lab and so like it would be impossible for our pi to like give everyone 100 percent of her time and so a lot of like there's a lot of substructuring within the lab of like direct report to the postdoc but then like still meet with the pi regularly to talk about research but like for day-to-day -day questions, talk to your research mentor. So like, depending how big the lab is, what a postdoc does can also change. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions while we're speaking, just yeah. let us know. Okay. So who should consider a postdoc? Well, I guess like everyone here is actually considering a postdoc, but um, I think normally when we think of postdoc, we see it only for like if we're going to academia, like that would be our first sense. And even though it might not sound very appealing to do a postdoc if you're not going directly to academia because of what Adam was saying, like you're gonna get paid as like as a trainee, et cetera. So it's just like delaying your entrance to the big leagues in a sense. Mm -hmm. I would advise the postdoc experience, even if you're thinking of going to industry or to uh, like setting up your own like uh, spin off or a venture or whatever, because you get the skills and you you have like some definite time, one year, two years. I would definitely say that you should do it like a short time, like one year, two years, if you're planning to not stay in academia. Um, but you'll get those years to actually become your own person in in the sense of having more autonomy, but not being completely alone or being like completely without a safety net because that you're still part of a lab. You still have your PI that it's like uh, in charge of everything in a way, but you're still having your own thing. So you you get other skills that you haven't learned before. And like working with a new PI, right? Like you get their whole philosophy around research, all of their, like what their field has to offer, all that stuff. All the same reasons that you're told, like don't do your grad school where you did undergrad, you're getting like a third institution to like learn from. So I think it's cool for that as well. Yeah. So you, you recommend not to do a, a postdoc if your PI gets your tenure in school? Yeah. Yes. If you like, I don't know. I mean, if you have a good relationship and want to keep working with them, I think 
that could work. Uh, you might have like a little bit of baggage of them remembering you as a student. So like, I don't know, I, it depends. But I think in general, I, I loved my old PI. I thought she was great, but it was nice to like move on and like do new projects. Cause I think I would have just like been continuing doing the exact same thing and not really learning as much as I am now. Yeah, I think if if you were to stay like the same way I stayed with my same PI for masters and then like stayed there was because I, I was like very happy in the lab and I felt like I could like really succeed there and publish, etc. And be happy, like mental health, happiness, like that's important. Um, so I would consider that, but I would like be very careful, very um, straightforward of what my new responsibilities would be. Mm -hmm. So that it like clearly has like a stop and start of like your new position and not just like a continuation. Mm -hmm. So that way you could like have like an actual postdoc experience and maybe shift your research a little bit into something new so that you can develop all these new skills that we are we're talking about. Yeah. I think it is fairly common though, like for people to stay a year or a year and a half in their like grad lab while they're like figuring out their next step. Cause like if you weren't really on top of the job search and you like are writing your dissertation and then you're done, like a, a lot of PIs are like just stay on while you figure it out. Yeah, so I have a few friends who stay with their yeah. in their environment for the postdoc and then um, like a year later just moved on to the new Yeah. Yeah. That's fairly common. Yeah, we're we're not saying it's necessarily bad. It's just like uh since we're trying to make you get advantage, the most advantage you can get from the postdoc experience, then the dynamics and the responsibilities and whatever you're gonna do needs to change in order for you to actually have a new thing instead of just yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you hinted at this uh, in terms of like how long is someone should be looking to a postdoc position. I've heard from some PIs that a red flag that they look at is like, like say it's 2023, and a student who applies is like got their PhD in 2012, and they're still just like hopping from lab to lab doing postdocs. Yes. Is that like a real thing? Like, is that a red flag that people in industry or academia will look at? Like, I always feel like there's a stigma associated with it once you get in there and just get out. I think I I can. <laughs> I have my own thoughts, but she can go first. <laughs> okay, so I think in a way that that could be a red flag, and it will depend. It's a based case case to case yes. basis. <laughs> Sorry, I always have trouble with that one. Um, <laughs> so in my case, for example, since I'm international, one of the things you need to consider, or that professors would consider would be how I ended up here. So it may take longer than like if you graduated from US and just stayed and start hopping. So it's pretty common in some universities uh, abroad that a lot of people are still doing postdocs. And it's also because there are so few um, actual positions uh, for professors. So a lot of PhDs have to stay as postdocs longer or getting to being lab managers or getting to being research associates or technicians to continue being in academia while they get a position as professor. So I guess um, it could be a red flag. I'm kind of against being red flagged because it depends a lot of, on the like, the pathway that that particular individual had to go through to get where they are and the, the opportunities that that person might have had. Um, all that said, I do think that it's good to set up a time frame that it's convenient for you. Like if you know that you want to go on into a position in industry or if you want to start your own, your own thing, uh, set up your time frame for maybe two up to three years that would be my that's my opinion you don't have to follow it but uh because as a scientist we just want to have everything done and we might not be able to stop like it, there's always new things to to do there's always new things that uh, intrigue us and 
there's always possibility to change your mind if you eventually don't want to end up in industry and continue in academia. But if you're like super positive, just time yourself up and start looking for options before that time like finishes, just for you to be able to jump into your next phase. Because if not, it could end up being as a red flag that you're just like delaying your next step. You know what I mean? But if you're still not sure, I think it's good that you give yourself some time to, to figure it out. Uh, I would add to that, like, everything that I've gone to that's like, what is a faculty search committee looking for? They like, as long as you have research, like productivity, and you can justify, like, I learned this skill in this lab, and I wanted to, like, work under this person because this, like, if you can, like, make a story out of it that's compelling, I don't think it is a red flag. There's also the scenario where someone gets, like, trapped in a postdoc and, like, I'm not going to write you a letter of rec until you get me my nature paper, right? And like some universities, you can stay like nine years and they're just like never giving you like any tangible proof that you were there. Here at UC, that can't happen. We actually have a cap of five years and you get one year of exception for year six if needed. So like you can't, you can't like be trapped in a postdoc at UC. So that's also something to consider. Like some people might just be in a situation that's not great. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of jobs can I get with a postdoc? And here I also want to comment the part that when we think of postdocs, we always think of postdocs in university. And right now there are a lot of postdocs in industry as well. So if you're interested in learning some other skills that might be more into that area, I would suggest that your postdoc, even though it's more research oriented, would be in the setting that you're looking forward to entering, because that one will also give you like the professional experience in industry that some um, like industry recruiters want. So that would be something else to consider. So you can you can get jobs in academia, in industry, in entrepreneurship government agencies, science policies, regulations, um, science communication, for example, as editors or as uh, like doing your own podcast or you're like working at a museum, maybe um, venture capital, intellectual properties, consulting, like there are so many options where depending on how you tailor your postdoc or your postdoc search, you will get the skills necessary to get into all those things. Yeah, like you're getting exposure to like writing grants, which is very attractive to a lot of different things. You have management, you work with budgets, things like that. So, and your like expertise, right? You have seven or eight years of experience in like doing research at that point. And that's like a very valuable thing in a lot of different sectors. So you don't just have to, because the academic pipeline is super constricted, right? Like there's not always the professor job that you want in the city you want doing the research you want. And sometimes it just doesn't pan out perfectly. So knowing everything you can do, I think is a little more empowering and like, doesn't make you feel like, what am I going to do with my life? Right? Like a lot of these things could probably be rewarding. Not to doom and gloom it, just like keeping it real. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, and then how do you find a postdoc position? So there are several ways to to do this and to look for it. There's no like uh, specific recipe to get the best. Um, you can either search for your own fellowship and the fellowship is yours and then you can go to any lab that you desire. So that is actually pretty good because you have the power in that sense. Uh, but also you can just like go through the professor and check what type of like if that professor has any funding for for a postdoc that could be true openings like position openings in nature careers and twitter linkedin uh, or the university job postings or industry job postings what i would say here is um your like how you look for a postdoc position has to be tailored depending on the skill set that you want to get. So, for example, if 
you want to go more into a management position in industry. Even if you are applying for a university postdoc, maybe you wouldn't want to go to a, a group that it's like three people and you're going to be the only postdoc because the management skills that you can get from that are not going to be as many as you would get in a very big lab that like will get you to say in, a, in an interview like, yeah, I manage like four or five people directly or I do like the orders for the whole lab. 30 people or stuff like that, that could actually give you those skill sets that your like industry is looking for or that the, your position, the probable, sorry, probable employer will be looking for. So depending on where you wanna go and the skills you wanna get or what you're lacking right now, like where, what will get me to the ultimate position that you wanna have? You always have to be very clear and have in mind what is, the thing that you want to do after postdoc mm -hmm. and what the gap between what you have right now and what will take you there those are the skills that you have to fill out with this postdoc position and you have two or three years to fill them out so where am i gonna be like will i have the most opportunities to fill those gaps the, those skills that I'm lacking. And then with when you have those like written down, it's more probable that you will check the list and you will find the one that is more suited for you. I don't know if that was very intense, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I would also add like, just like everything with like education, it's kind of like, there's a lot of deadlines and it's almost like a game. Like you have to like know all the rules to like, Put yourself in a good position so like with a lot of these fellowships if you like you want to like already know who you want to work for you usually need to put a prospective mentor on these fellowships and like be applying during your like last year of graduate school to like know that you have the funding because a lot of pis want you to come in with your own funding when you're doing a postdoc yes unless they're in a big rich lab uh so you know depending on the type of opportunity you're after you do have to kind of plan ahead i I had seven months of COVID to give me a little buffer on that, but not everyone has that situation, right? So yeah, just uh, be aware. And then if you like at a conference, that's something not on the slide. At a conference, if someone gives a really cool talk and they're like, I'm looking for postdocs, like if you're only in your third year or something, just like keep them in mind and like maybe try and make that relationship the next year. They might have other opportunities in the future. And like, yeah, the networking aspect of academia is kind of overwhelming, but you got to get used to it, unfortunately, if you want to be in academia. Yeah, and also like trying not to um, get everything done in the last three months where you're also going to be writing your own dissertation and like worrying about that. So even if you're starting like way ahead, you can start writing those proposals because believe me, they're going to be proofread and like there's gonna be a lot of edits. And then if you're gonna send it like for different, um, like different fellowships, you, you're gonna to have to like change stuff in each one. So I would advise that you start ahead, like one year at least to start developing this. I know it sounds like, uh, but it will, I promise you that it will eventually be the best thing that you could have done because if not, you will have everything at the end and like, Having job security, it's a big thing when you're about to defend your thesis. Like, you know what's your next thing gonna be. But also neither of us did that and we're fine. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. We're saying like post-mortem yeah. in a sense. <laughs> so to, to avoid the stress that we felt, uh, we would advise that. But if not, opportunities arise. So don't worry. Uh, yeah, so next question that uh, we want you all to consider is like, what should you consider when picking a postdoc position? Like Yvonne said earlier, it kind of is a finite position. It's going to be like one to three years probably. So it's not like life altering if you like move somewhere for three years, but also like it is three years of your life. It's like probably around the age of 30 ish. So you want to like consider where you want to be at that time too. Um, 
yeah. So for me, like, I was really drawn to coming back to Southern California because I knew my family was in LA. And so being in San Diego is nice because it's close, but not like right in their backyard. Uh, so that was a big consideration for me. Also, the prestige of the lab, because unfortunately, prestige in academia matters a lot for the next step. Uh, that was important. Uh, having like the kind of city or a town that you want to live in, like I'm not really drawn to like a small secluded college town vibe. I, I like being in a city where there's things outside the university. So San Diego is nice for that reason. Uh, the cost of living is something really important to consider, especially like I'm sure you're all aware living in California is very expensive. So even on postdoc salary, you think you're making twice as much money and then your bills just double. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, uh, those are things to consider. Um, and like, if you're just itching to live somewhere different, but not forever, like it could be a good time to just explore that. I don't know if you want to add to any of that. Yeah, like in my case, I did the abroad thing before and then I came here, but I know that a lot of people you like from US, they did the do all their education here. So maybe it could be a good idea for looking the abroad part uh, there, depending on what you want to do. I think industry wise, if you want to end up in industry, going abroad wouldn't be the best thing because like, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't be as translatable for recruitments after. Uh, but if you want to stay in academia, you can find a very good professor in your area or the area that you want to like venture in, and he can be anywhere. And then you can do that the whole like living abroad experience for one two years. You can plan yourself for doing two postdocs, like uh, two two years, two years, one year, two years, something like that. That could also work. Like you you don't have to. Um, set your mind as to like, this is the place where I'm gonna be for the next three years of my life. It's always like, it's always a possibility that you can change your mind. And I think it's hard for us in science to get the whole of that, but we need to like be open to that, to that option as well. Especially if we're trying to see other, other like, specialties that we might consider but we're not very sure like it might not work out so just like go back or do something else it's also fair i had one more thing to add that i forgot like yvonne said earlier uh this is like the first job where you're like not a student at all and so you do lose a lot of like those perks of being a student as well so considering kind of like what is the work culture where you're ending up not even just in the lab but like it within the state, within the university system, within the company, whatever, you want to consider all those things. You want to like, if they have any documentation about like, what is like the paid time off or the like sick leave or anything like that, you want to like really check those things because as students, you don't have to get into the weeds on that as often, but like it is a real job. So like those kinds of information are available. So you want to check that as well. Yeah, check also, like, if you're international, if it's going to go into your retirement or not. Uh, I mean, if depending on how old are you or something, that could be a, like a thing to consider. Also, cost of benefits. Yes. Postdocs at UC, we only pay 12 bucks a month for healthcare. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, but all those things are, are important because, as we said, like, it's actually a job now. So... Yeah, you should you should consider that part as well. I was gonna say something over there. I think we're at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So we know it's almost food time. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, when you start doing like your postdoc, did you find it difficult to change from your PhD research to your postdoc research? you have to learn like a lot of new skills or I'm asking because um, I don't want to say I'm like sick what I'm doing in my PhD but I want to move to something different in the same position like in the same environment uh, way like doing research in the area but I don't want to keep on doing like the same research that I'm doing on my PhD. Mm -hmm. Is there like a, a huge gap between this two? 
Yeah, so for example, in my case, I did stay like with my general topic, which was like using plant viruses, but the the application changed completely. So I went more into that. So I, I think during my whole research career, I always stay like plant viruses. And then I've done different application work. So in a case, like in this sense, um, I didn't change that much. However, the like I did feel like a lot of change when I started like postdoc because, for example, in my other lab, my first postdoc, I was the only postdoc in the lab, and we were like forty people, and there were probably like twenty grad students. I was the only postdoc, the wow. PIs, and a lot of undergrads as well. So I was basically not doing research at all. <laughs> I was mostly mentoring, setting up like uh, like ways to do work for everyone, like just to be able to get a hold of the lab management part. So when I came here, I'm basically like retaking the the research part a little bit more, but still doing a lot of the of the lab managing part. And I think it was different for for Adam yeah. when he started. So for me, like the types of skills that I was using in my other lab, like I was doing a lot of bacterial expression of proteins, things like this, and like running gels and things that you do in a typical biochem lab. And a lot of those were still here and I do them on a regular basis, but also like there were a bunch of new skills, like I've never worked in a greenhouse before. I've never purified a virus. I've never used an ultra centrifuge, right? So it's like, you're still grounded and like understand the space, but there's a lot of new things to like try and do that kind of, I think reinvigorate you and remind you why you're like excited about doing research because yeah I mean if you're if you're feeling bored it's because you're at the end of your PhD and you're like I want to be done with this project but like if you still want to do science then you like find your fire again when you have a new direction to work in I think yeah I think try to find the common ground a little bit because if not you will feel like completely out of like yeah you want to know where to start but if you still have something that it's similar and then from that, like just build up. Yeah. Also that transition of like being top dog in your old lab to like, yeah. oh, don't break that thing when you're postdoc <laughs> is like very like, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens. I never broke anything to be no. clear. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, yeah. This question I guess for everyone, but what was it difficult to apply for a Kata International for a postdoc position? Was the same that process I mean difficulty difficulty uh when you apply for your grad studies or what did you do? Yeah, so um I think in our case your cover letter should be amazing. Because I mean, I, I don't want to say that every professor would be like that. In my case, Nicole is also like she's not from US, so I guess she would just take into consideration everyone that applies, but I don't know if that's the case for everyone. So if they see a university that is not the most common university or that they haven't heard of it before, I guess you have to uh, make them know that you're good or that you're like, in parallel with everyone that it's applying for that job and that would be by showing your like your publications like i wouldn't just put it as uh, like as an attachment in the or like write something in the email that says like i've been working with this professor that might be like common knowledge if it's someone from the same field uh, or I have published i don't know in any amount of papers in q1 um, journals or something that like puts like levels you with any other candidate for the position and from there just get the interview like that's my my thing when you get the interview you can just like try to do it but I wouldn't say it's a disadvantage but it's challenging but I I've, I've been able to do it so I'm sure you and if you're already here for grad school and you're on your F1, it's mm -hmm. like pretty easy yeah. to just keep that going. Like F1 STEM OPT, you like almost get your whole postdoc covered on the same visa. Yeah, so that's true. Yeah, it's most postdocs who come from abroad have to do like J1 and it's a little more difficult. So it's nice to already have the F1 if you did grad school here. 
Yeah, I probably have like the, the worst case scenario because I already had another postdoc experience and also was abroad. So most, like a lot of people don't get a second postdoc and I was still able to get it. So I'm not saying like, mm, I was still able to get it, but I mean, there's the option. You just have to like state clearly why are you looking for the position? Yes. Yeah, so um, I know you mentioned the thing about overlapping, just like the proper ratio between what you're qualified for and what you want to train to develop new skills. So I feel like when I was joining uh, my PhD, I felt much less pressure to like be qualified for anything because I'd see in my lab, like our neighbor, neighboring labs, we would all be doing the same kind of work, like say theoretical, like fluid mechanics in my case. But like everybody would be from a completely different background. Like I was like the standard engineering background. My friend was like bioengineering, probably hadn't done much of what I had done. There was like a physics major and like it was all over the place. But I feel like now that I'm, I've done like four or five years of like, because of COVID, I couldn't do much experimentation. So I've been locked into theory. And I feel like that's kind of like, I feel like I'm kind of trapped into this path now. And so I do want to get more experience on like more practical, uh, you know, ventures to like experiments and, experiments and stuff. But I feel afraid to like apply for positions because it's like, well, you're not, you haven't touched a single machine before. So like, yeah. what are you going to do, right? So like, should I try to apply for positions that I'm not like really qualified for, or like is that something you should get? Okay. I mean, if you have all the theoretical knowledge, like at some point the theory gets applied, right? So like you, it's not like you don't understand the system. It's just about getting your hands like into it. Uh, so I think there should be PIs that value that. Uh, I think there are probably a lot of labs that do like kind of half in both courts. So like maybe somewhere like there would make sense so that you can like, they know that you can still succeed in half the lab for sure, but then give you the opportunity to explore the other half. I'm not really in theoretical anything, so I'm not hundred percent sure, but I do think that those kinds of PIs exist. Yeah, one thing that, that worked for me and like, I think it's a value thing is when you're applying to any lab, uh, try to see how your expertise can be translated into the new lab. So don't go like, oh yeah, I wanna like, I'm applying to this job and yeah, this is what I do. Like, no, this is what I will do for you. So when you put that, you can say like, well, I have this knowledge in this and this and this, but I could apply it in this. And you can be very honest, like I haven't worked with this, like this instrument um, like in a long time or ever. But I think that with what I know, I could use this or I can be trained into doing this and this, but always have a plan, uh, like don't come empty handed because that way you're showing the PI that, uh, that you have ideas that you can help them develop those ideas. And you're not just gonna be a passive, uh, like older student, you know, like you are in the next level and you can help them out with that. And that could also cover up some of the things that you're lacking in a way, because you you have like, one of the things that differentiates when you're uh, like a postdoc or a uh, like a fifth year uh, PhD student versus uh, one that is just arriving, it's uh, also the the conceptualizing, the the troubleshooting, like even though you haven't done something in particular, it will take you so much less time to do it or to eventually like get the grasp of it than if you were starting because you already went through a lot of similar stuff even if it's another another instrument so that is the thing that you want to show that you know how to do in a way i would add one more thing doling out that kind of information in the cover letter you want to make it really clear like I was reading your research. I think it relates to mine this way. I have all these ideas, right? And then in the interview, like once you are in the space, you can be like, yeah, I don't necessarily, I haven't worked with that instrument, but I'm excited to learn, right? Like you're earnest there. Don't, don't be too earnest up front or you might not get the interview. Yeah. And also professors get a lot of bad, like just like copy paste, not personalized at all. Like I want a postdoc type letters so like if you actually write a thoughtful one and like show that you're thinking about the research and it actually like is the right fit for you it's very likely that you can get an interview you just have to like put effort into it and not just like copy paste send off like i only applied to like five different postdocs like 
in that seven month period because I was like, who do I actually want to work for that I feel qualified to work with that's matching all these criteria that I want, right? So you should be intentional and then I think it will be rewarding. And if you get a no, like no thank you, write back uh, <laughs> very politely, but say like, oh, consider me if you have any other opening in the future. I wrote that and she wrote me right back and say, oh yeah, I can consider you. Like, <laughs> yes, so, but but it was like not just leaving the email there like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Like they took time to answer a no, just write back like, oh, I'm sorry about this, but I would like another opportunity in the future if you have one. So that could also work. Any other questions before we all go get pizza? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wonder how difficult it is for an international student to apply for a job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, very difficult. Yes. So there are a number of, of fellowships you can apply to. We can maybe like we can give you our emails. I don't know if Truth Sina you you can maybe share or we can just put it in right now. Um, but we can share the ones that we know of. Um, all the agency, government agencies, you won't be able to apply to those. It's not required. But yeah, but there I have from private companies. So those were the ones that I was able to like to get. Uh, or like different um, like university funded stuff mm -hmm. that are, could be for anyone, but that like will depend on your PI. It's not something that you can apply for, but that your PI like just gives to you. But yeah, all the all the industry ones you can get. Uh, there are some from like specific countries that you can also get. There's Fulbright. There are like some for internationals that you can work out. I can I can give you if you're interested. I can give you the list of the ones that I know of. But it is it is a thing. Like you should uh, you should know that it's going to be harder to get funding, but it's possible. Cool. Okay, let's eat.